Now, Eyewitness News begins with your forecast first. Hi everyone, a good Tuesday to you on the iNet. We've lost the sunshine to the darker clouds. That's kind of a precursor or sign of, yes, some rainfall, some heavy rain moving through the region. After a warm day, some of us again getting into the lower 80s. Yeah, with this news, Doppler radar showing the heavies of action right now across northern portions of Oneida County. Uh, north of 365 over toward 12 by Trenton. And we'll deal with scattered showers, a thunder shower this evening, a break, and then more showers coming in on the overnight period. Your eyewitness news at 6 starts now. Local news that matters. This is Eyewitness News at 6 on WUTR. Very happy birthday to a New York Mills resident who turned 102 years old today. In the honor, America Day's theme was announced to be celebrating our heritage. Heritage, excuse me, and the events for the month were also released. We'll bring you those details. Plus, tomorrow night you'll be able to watch the History Center's annual telethon right here on WUTR. Jessica Landman brings us a preview. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for Eyewitness News at 6. I'm Shelby Pay. We start our show off tonight wishing a very happy birthday to Stanley Pocheba, who turned 102 years old today. After moving to New York Mills in 1925 at just three years old, Pocheba started his very long life of service. He served during World War II in the United States Army, earning a Purple Heart, and he also worked at an Army Air Corp base as part of a fire and crash rescue crew. Throughout his many years, he has held many different jobs, but that didn't stop him from his commitment to his fellow military men. He founded the Edward Bader Post No. 21 of the Polish Legion of American Veterans, and Village of New York Mills wants to keep honoring this hero by hanging a hometown hero banner for him in the village. He still remembers what it was like when he moved here almost 100 years ago. This was all farmland. Yeah. It was all farmland. Erie Canal was here, but uh, they wouldn't use it anymore. Uh, but everything, everything has changed completely. Well, I belong to all the organizations, you know, so I have, I have a lot, I am blessed I have a lot of friends. Again, we wish a very happy birthday to Stanley and hope he has many more. And the Honor America Day's theme was announced to be celebrating our heritage and events for the month were released too. Our eyewitness news reporter Jessica Landman has that story. It's kind of Rome's premier event of the year. Um, there's tens of thousands of people that come. Yesterday, the Rome Chamber of Commerce officially announced the events and parade for Honor America Days. Citywide events will start July 4th and go until the parade on July 27th. It starts on July 4th with um, the relighting of the Revere horse sign, which is big for Rome. Um, it's, we've, everyone has wanted this to be relit for years. Um, there's also going to be fireworks on July 4th, which is also something that the Romans have wanted. Um, it, we have tons of different events throughout the month of July. Um, it all kind of culminates to the Honor America Days Parade and uh, Syracuse Symphony Orchestra um, concert at 8 p.m. with more fireworks. We like fireworks here in Rome. Yeah, there's going to be tons of things. There's um, the city of Rome is doing a business after hours at the Rome Martin Community Center. Um, Cycle the Erie's block party is happening. Um, there's going to be outdoor movies. There's the World Series of Bocce at the Tucolana Club. Um, where the city is doing a Christmas in July on West Dominic Street, which is the street. And then Honor America Day is Law Enforcement Day. And then um, there's Canal Fest. That's kind of the end. Almost 40 years ago, the mayor of Rome had an idea, and from there, it took off. Carl Eilenberg was the mayor at the time. Um, he kind of wanted to have this big celebration, and he brought together local business leaders, the chamber, and he wanted to kind of have some sort of celebration honoring America. We had Griffiths Air Force Base at the time, and it kind of was just the celebration to honor everything America. Everyone is welcome at all the citywide events, and Rome will certainly be the place to be in the month of July. 
Reporting in Rome, I'm Jessica Landman, Eyewitness News. And tomorrow night, you'll be able to watch the History Center's annual telethon right here on WUTR. Jessica Landman brings us the details. The United County History Center will host our 19th annual telethon fundraiser. All the funds raised in the telethon go directly to the History Center and everything they do for the community. We are raising funds for everything we do here. Um, so we're a nonprofit and we don't receive annual government funding, so we rely on our memberships, we rely on, rely on philanthropic gifts, grants, things like that to support our operating budget. And so it supports everything from um, the exhibits that we have, which are open five days a week. Um, we do regular public programming, which ranges from traditional lectures to musical performances. Um, this fall, we might even be having a play. Um, educational outreach and opportunities. So we host a number of interns throughout the year and during the summer. Um, you know, visiting schools, working um, with teachers, you name, you name it, uh, whatever we do, this, it supports us. Um, even al also our research library, so it supports our archives, preservation of the artifacts and the paper documents that we, we have in our collection. The telethon will take place tomorrow, Wednesday, May 15th, from 5 to 8 p.m., and will be broadcast live right here on WUTR and streamed on cnyhomepage.com. Tune in tomorrow to see the Oneida County History Center. Reporting in Utica, I'm Jessica Landman, Eyewitness News. For more of the latest in local news, weather, and sports, be sure to check out our website, cnyhomepage.com. So it was a beautiful summer-like day today, Tim, but the rain is coming in. Will it stick around? Uh, it looks like we get a deal with the showers, the rain here as we head through the evening to break. And then more action coming in as we head through the, uh, the overnight period. Uh, we'll look closer at what's going on now and a look ahead into tomorrow. You're right with its news, seven day forecast. That's all coming up right after this. Now, your eyewitness weather forecast. 
Again, everyone, a good Tuesday night to you. Hope you're able to dodge some of the action here over the last couple of hours. But a good thing, it'll actually knock some of the pollen out of the air. Thank goodness, because tree pollen has been high. We drop only down to a 5.1 now based on the latest trends for tomorrow. And then we rocket ship up to almost 11 on Friday. Cool contrast on the skies. We look over toward Oriskany and Route 12, a little blue. A little darkness, and the darkness kind of an indication of some heavier bursts of rain moving through the region. Temps real quick, more Westmoreland right now at 78. Prospect has cooled down to 68. Verona at 72. Clayville at 69. But we're still in the lower 80s now. Little Falls, St. Johnsville, and out toward Dolgeville will cool down to 72, though, at Haynes Payne's Hollow. We're on the view out further. 79 at Lavo, 74 in Norwich. And 75, we know you're watching from Schoharie County over in Cobleskill. All right, here is the Eyewitness News Doppler radar. On into southern portions of Herkimer County, southern Oneida County. This is going to be tracking just east of Utica in terms of the heaviest rainfall. Meantime, the town of Herkimer, the village of Herkimer will get a good burst of rain. Some good cloudy ground lightning now crossing over Route 12. As you make way north of uh, 365 there, Trenton Way, a good burst of rain. That's up by Old Forge. And then our friends over in Montgomery County can't leave you guys out as well. Good burst of rain will track east of Canada Harry over more so as you make your way toward Fonda Fultonville as well as Gloversville. Let's go ahead. We'll broaden the view out. Got a boundary to our north and west. It's kind of losing its punch. Because as we make our way back toward mid-country, here's our wave of low pressure here. And this will end up throwing the moisture our way. So we deal with scattered showers, a couple of thunder showers as we hit through the next couple of hours. That action diminishes, and then this moisture ends up tracking up toward us on the overnight period. So check out the future cast. It doesn't have quite the intensity of what we're seeing right now on the radar, but it gives you a pretty good idea on placement. And watch the trends as everything diminishes as we head toward 10 and 11 o'clock. Now the moisture will track up from the south and the southwest as we push through the overnight period. So showers redeveloping after midnight, pretty much after 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, through the pre-dawn, and tomorrow, cooler, obviously with the showers and a damp feel to the air. And we continue to see that shower threat heading into tomorrow night. But the big thing now for Thursday is the fact that we'll end up seeing a partly sunny sky, isolated showers, and it looks like we could keep it completely dry for Friday. Forecast overnight lows tonight. A lot of us low in mid-50s in central New York State. Cooler tomorrow. <laughs> That's it. Highs only 60 to 65. Don't worry, there's some warmer temps on the seven-day forecast. Low tonight, 57. We'll see the action over the next couple of hours diminish before the return of the showers on the overnight period. For tomorrow, showers, cooler, damp, 64. Rest of the extended forecast for Thursday, partly sunny. Isolated showers, not bad, 73. Come Friday, looking good. Partly sunny, nice, 75. Weekend forecast. Showers Saturday, better Sunday. And looking ahead to next week, still the risk of a shower, but at least temps will be in the 70s. Shall we completely spot on? A taste of summer today. We'd like to get back to it again pretty soon. Eh, Friday's not looking bad. Back to you, Shelby. All right, I agree. Thanks, Tim. Still to come tonight on Eyewitness News at 6, 16-year-old Devin, Devin Saylor, Saylor has, has 31 anaphylactic allergies. He visited the state capitol to advocate for legislation that would provide more access to EpiPens. Those details next. Bill O'Reilly on Cuomo. I don't say it often. But Bill O'Reilly, you're spot on. TV's liveliest, most honest debate. And I enjoy uh, doing this with you. I would never tell anybody that, Cuomo, so keep it just between you I and know. me, okay? Tonight at 8, 7 central, only on News Nation. News Nation tonight, murder or suicide? The fight for answers over the death of a South Carolina pastor's wife. Ashley talks to an expert about why the pastor's recent body language could be telling. Banfield tonight, 10, 9 central, only on News Nation.
You're watching Eyewitness News at 6 on WUTR. An upstate New York teen has traveled to Washington, D.C. and now Albany to speak with lawmakers about legislation he'd like to see passed to help others like him who have allergies. Capitol correspondent Jamie DeLine spoke with him about what he'd like to see happen. 16-year-old Devin Saller has 31 anaphylactic allergies. He came to the state capitol to advocate for legislation that would provide more access to epinephrine. Epinephrine auto-injectors, they are the only treatment for anaphylaxis that we have currently. Saller wants to see epinephrine in places where defibrillators are located and for all first responders to carry it with them. His state senator, Republican Peter Oberrocker, has a background in EMS. Any tools that we can give, any tools that we can give our first responders, people out in the field, that deal Deal with these types of issues, why wouldn't we do it? According to Saylor, a pack of two EpiPens can cost as much as $700. It's deceiving to say, oh, it's only $700, only $700. You're not just buying one pack. You need a pack for school, a pack for home, a pack for grandma's house. Maybe you want a backup pack. And here's the big part, they expire every year. To help people with lower incomes, Devin would like to see a price cap implemented for the life-saving treatment. One of the bills that we are asking about is an epinephrine price cap for private uh, high deductible insurance that would limit the cost for yearly EpiPens at $100. I think that is a totally reasonable ask. It's certainly going to be an uphill battle, but these are $7 to manufacture. You're making $100. I think that is still an extraordinarily high profit margin. The legislation is currently in committee. I think it's something that we should really look about. I mean, we were talking about that with uh, when it came to um, our diabetics and insulin, right? I mean, these are some things that aren't being abused. There are some things that really do have uh, a big value to a quality of life. Again, why wouldn't we do that to make things just that much more available and life-saving? Reporting in Albany, I'm Jamie DeLine. And this weekend, history will be made as the first lupus walk in the region will be held. Eyewitness News reporter Jessica Landman has the details. The Masonic Medical Research Institute will be hosting their first ever lupus walk this Saturday to raise funds for lupus research here. We will have more than 300 walkers joining us for this inaugural event. We're so excited. Um, we'll be having a press conference at 1030 where we'll be announcing uh, the, all of the money with, that we've raised and we'll get to announce all the names of the teams that have come here to support us. So the walk is entirely donation based. So anybody can come and join us and can contribute to our lupus research here at MMRI. All proceeds will go towards and benefit the lupus research program that we have here. And for those who struggle with this autoimmune disease, this cure is vital. So my research on lupus is really focused on trying to figure out how and why people get lupus. So lupus is an autoimmune disease that basically involves your immune system mistaking your own DNA and your cell's nucleus as a pathogen and it tries to attack it, which is obviously a really bad time <laughs> for your body. We don't really understand all the molecular details inside the cell that leads to that happening. And really what immune cells are focused on is listening to instructions from the rest of the body and then carrying out an attack on a pathogen. That language they're speaking to themselves inside the cell, we can't decode or translate yet. So that's really what I focus on. Well, because we're tra really trying to understand why uh, we get disease. Nobody really knows what causes lupus. Um, Theoretically, we think that there are some genetic uh, indications that cause SLE, but it, they're not in and of themselves alone enough. So typically, we think that there are environmental factors, viral infections that might be triggering them that can induce the development of those diseases. So w because we don't understand it, we're very interested in trying to figure out the mechanisms so that we can find more effective therapies. So lupus for the last 30 years, we really not had any sufficient therapies for SLE. Only in the last five years or so have there been some new developments of some drugs that could potentially work, but only for a very small number of people. So we're trying to find a better way to treat them. Uh, lupus affects about 1.5 million people in the United States, about 120,000 in New York State alone. Um, which means that there are a lot of people who know or love someone who had lupus. Um, one of those people happened to be my own mother who died of lupus in 2009. Reporting in Utica, I'm Jessica Landman, Eyewitness News. And tonight is the biggest game of Rome Free Academy's lacrosse season. And not because a division title or playoffs are on the line, 
but they want to win this one for Officer Michael Jensen. Over the last month, the community has been rallying around their athletics programs to help his family in our fundraising today. Jensen was a former lacrosse player for the Black Knights, and coach Keel Adams says his team has been ready all week. We'll bring you more tonight on Eyewitness News First at 10 over on WFXV and on Eyewitness News at 11 right here on WUTR. And speaking of sports, still to come tonight on Eyewitness News at 6, Caitlin Clark makes her pro debut tonight in the WNBA. We'll bring you a preview after the break. Right now, Eyewitness Sports. Good evening, this is Eyewitness Sports. Tonight, the most celebrated name in women's basketball since Brianna Stewart will make her pro debut. Caitlin Clark, the top scorer in college basketball, men or women, will take the court in Connecticut as a member of the Indiana Fever. There is a ton of interest in her play and, as a result, a greater interest in the WNBA. Reporter Kent Pierce has this preview. It may be the first game of the season, but we're expecting a playoff type atmosphere tonight as the top scorer in college basketball history makes her professional debut. Caitlin Clark and the Indiana Fever kick off the WNBA season against the Connecticut Sun. Attendance and TV viewership for Clark's college games broke records and often topped the numbers for the men's game. She is the face of the rising interest in women's basketball, and she knows nobody appreciates women's basketball more than Connecticut. You know the fans, fans are going to be awesome. Um, I'm expecting a great crowd, and you know that's how it's always been there. Uh, whether it's been the college level, whether it's been the pro level, there's always it's always been a great environment. She is part of a dynamic rookie class for the league. Season ticket purchases all over the WNBA are way up this year, and tickets for any Indiana game are sold out or selling fast. This is what we live for, right? The, to play in sold out arenas, to play in um, these type of environments, to, to showcase you know, the talented players that we have and for a new national audience who hasn't seen them before to be able to put their eyes on them. Clark may be the latest big star elevating women's basketball, but here in Connecticut, we have a long history of doing just that. The UConn women won 11 NCAA titles, producing dozens of WNBA players. That professional journey for Clark starts tonight in Connecticut. I'm excited to experience it for the first time. It'll be cool and special for me to go around to all these, you know, WNBA arenas for the first time and experience each one. And all that begins here 
here tonight. And with the kind of basketball history in Connecticut, it's no wonder that the almost 9,000 seats here at Mohegan Sun Arena are all sold out. In Uncasville, I'm Kent Pierce, News 8. That's all for sports. We'll close out the broadcast when we return. Eyewitness News at 6 continues on WUTR. All right, everyone. Well, that's all for Eyewitness News at 6. ABC World News Tonight is next. We'll see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.